You're about to watch a St. James Sermon. Thanks for joining us. We're currently preaching our way through the Book of Romans. Martin Luther once said that the letter to the Romans is truly the most important piece of the New Testament. And the more one reads it, the more precious it becomes. Well, we hope that's your experience too as we journey through this wonderful book together. Thanks for watching. Just some family news. There's always that one person in the family who does the thing that you need to correct. We need to park properly, people. Can I encourage you, if you drive to St. James and you need to park, that you don't park across driveways, that you don't park across thing, places that are going to make it difficult for residents to leave, um, because otherwise they get all grumpy with us and they don't listen to our message about Jesus. So can I ask you to be considerate about that? And then if you have children, our kids' camp is coming up in the middle of May. So please do be uh, flagging that. It's going to be from the 10th to the 12th of May. Um, plan your lives accordingly and get your kids to camp. They'll have an amazing time. And if you're a bit older than that, you're a young adult, then uh, we start again this evening, 7.30. Scott will be leading young adults this term. Um, so you're going to be in for a great time of hearing God's word uh, taught. Now, there are also things that happen here outside of church hours. And one of those is the Bikers with Bibles. Um, they are going for a ride today. And if you'd rather be on your feet, you can do a hike today. Uh, who is the hiking person who, that they can find information from? Kathy, is it you? The lady down here will give you information about that. Apparently, it's an easy walk today, um, but they'd love you to join them. And then if you enjoy music, and if you have heard Colin Peckham's uh, choir, I'm going to hold this up so that you see the color. You won't obviously be able to see any of the words. Um, on the 20th of April, they're having a big celebration in the city, and they'd love you to join them. The flies are in the foyer. Um, it's great. It's a, a sing-along as well as a concert. So you can go and actually sing these extraordinary hymns um, with this huge choir and an orchestra, and this is really a very special experience. I think that's all. We're now going to watch a video clip about partnership and why it's important to be one here at St. James. Thanks, guys. Hello, St. James. Partnership classes are starting soon, and I'm here to tell you what they're all about and why you should consider joining us. At St. James, we refer to partnership rather than membership for two main reasons. Firstly, because partnership is an active word. It describes participation and not merely being a passenger. But secondly, the membership that matters most is when Jesus calls you into the fellowship of God's church. That's something that every Christian shares, no matter where they meet on a Sunday. But of course, once you become a Christian, the Bible's expectation is that we become active in a local church. And the language that the New Testament uses for that is partnership. Who is partnership for? Well, that's easy. If you're a Christian, if you call St. James your home church, and if you've been attending regularly for at least six months, we'd love to have you at partnership classes. You might have been coming to St. James for years and never taken this formal step. Well, it's never too late and you're welcome to join us as well. This term, partnership classes run over three weeks. We start next week, Sunday the 21st, after the 10 a.m. service. We're gonna be in the meeting room at 11.30. What are we gonna be doing? Well, we're gonna be talking about what is God's church? What does it mean to be a member of that? And then we're gonna follow up with some talk about partnership at St. James specifically. We're gonna be looking at our vision as a church, our denomination, and our responsibility as partners here at St. James. You can grab an application form today after the service at the information desk. This might just be what you've been looking for, a way for you to take the next step in growing deeper, not just in your own personal work with the Lord, but in fellowship amongst us here at St. James. Remember, God does extraordinary things with ordinary people. So why don't you come and join us partnership classes next week. We look forward to seeing you there. God bless.
Thank you, Remote Scott. Now it is time for taking up the collection. Why don't you chat to one another if you have been a member, a partner here at St. James for years and years, and if you're thinking about it, and have a conversation about why you think that that is or isn't a good idea. Good morning, St. James. This morning's reading comes from Romans. I'll be reading from chapter 1, verse 1 through to verse 17. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son who was descended from David according to the, according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ, to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I may now at last succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you, that is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you, as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, everybody. If indeed you did run the half marathon and now you are showered, dressed and in your right mind, then uh, you certainly deserve many rewards. I have never run a half marathon in my life and I have no intention to start. <laughs> I used to run to get fit for sport and run away from people. That was it. End of running. Let me pray. Father, thank you for our time now, both in your word and at your table. And I pray that as we come to both, we may do so with genuine faith, with an open mind to your word, and with hearts that trust you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week <coughs> we began our series called Mere Christianity. And with a look at Romans 1, 1 to 4, at Paul's teaching about the unique identity of Jesus and the supreme authority of Jesus. We saw that Jesus is God's divine Son, the second person of the Trinity, <clears throat> the one who has entered our world, the one who has entered our world at a moment in history, at a place, a geographical location, one who came as a descendant of David in accordance with all of God's promises, and one who by his resurrection from the dead was demonstrated to be, declared to be God's universal king. God the Son declared the Son of God, that is God's authoritative king, as described in Psalm 2. Jesus Christ, the divine Son, who rules the world. 
That was the focus of Romans 1, 1 to 4. And so the conclusion we drew from those verses is that at its heart, Christianity is Christ. That if we want to come face to face with mere Christianity, to use C.S. Lewis's title from his famous book, if we want to come face to face with mere Christianity, we have to come face to face with Jesus himself. Today, as we continue to think of mere Christianity, Christianity as the Bible defines it, not as popular understanding has it or as people perhaps misrepresent it, but Christianity as the Bible defines it, as we come face to face again with mere Christianity, I want us to think today from Romans again about Christianity being good news for all. So Christianity is Christ. Christianity is good news for all. Now I wonder what the description of Christianity as good news, I wonder how you think or how you feel about that description. It is a striking one, right? That Christianity is good news. For many people, Christianity is simply religion. It's simply something you do. Perhaps even doctrine, something you will believe. But what about Christianity as news? And what about Christianity as good news? Not everybody sees it that way, right? You may have friends, family, colleagues, mates at university or school or whatever it is, and for them, Christianity is anything but good news. Well, I hope that by the end of today, you'll come to agree with me that it is good news if you haven't already done so. The description of Christianity as news, as good news, really arises out of a word that Paul uses. Five times in those 17 verses that were read for us, Paul uses this word. It's the word gospel. He uses it at the beginning, in the middle, at the end of our section. He uses it throughout this letter and especially again at the end. Paul is a gospel man. In fact, by the end of this letter, he can even call the gospel his gospel. Paul is a gospel person through and through. That's how we should think of him and that's how he describes himself. He's set apart for the gospel in verse 1. Now that word gospel the word from which we get our English word evangel from, it's just a rendition of the Greek word euangelion, gospel, evangel, that word actually means momentous or important news. It's not a particularly Christian word, gospel, <clears throat> although we, I suppose, use it most likely in terms of Christianity. Sometimes people just use it for truth, right? I'm telling you gospel. <laughs> it happened. But in Paul's day, and in the, the first century when this letter was written, the word gospel was just a Greek word for important news or momentous news. Headline news, if you like. So if you thought gospel, you'd think of something that sort of was on the facing page of the news feed. Something that was the first headline that you would read. You remember that we used to have those big square things, sort of white with writing on them? You could fold them, and if you were in London on the tube, you had to fold it so small that it didn't go into someone's ear or someone's eye as you read it. It's called a newspaper. <laughs> well, this is not page four, page five, page six news in the newspaper. This is front page news, front page headline. That's what the word gospel means, important news, momentous news. But when it comes to the New Testament... It always has with it this additional idea that it's momentous or important news that is good news. <clears throat> Even when it tells us hard truth about ourselves. And we're going to see that next week as we look at chapter 1 verse 18. <clears throat> you may as well brace yourself for next week because chapter 1 verse 18 following of Romans is hard news. It's straight talk. It's difficult news. It's unsettling news. But even there, as I hope we'll see next week, it's good news. So Paul has this momentous news in mind as he writes this letter. And what we want to say is that Christianity is this momentous news 
and good news for everyone. Well, what is this news about? This momentous news, this gospel? Well, Paul tells us right at the beginning of our chapter, in fact, in the very first verse, <coughs> that he was set apart, you see it there, for the gospel of God. Whenever you see the little word of in the New Testament, you have to make your decision, what does the writer actually mean? In this little part of our talk, or my talk, I want us to look at verse 1, the gospel of God, and verse 9, the gospel of his son. Do you see those two statements? Verse 1, the gospel of God. Verse 9, the gospel of his son. Both times it's a genitive case. Now of <coughs> could mean belonging to. The gospel of God could mean the gospel that belongs to God. And that would certainly be true. Because whatever else the gospel in the Bible is, it belongs to God. It's God's gospel. It doesn't belong to us. We don't get to change it. We don't get to invent it. We don't get to fiddle with it. We don't get to cut out the bits we don't like and put in extra bits that we think ought to be there because it doesn't belong to us. This is God's gospel. But I don't think Paul is just talking about the gospel as something which belongs to God. I think here he's using this case in the original language to talk about the gospel that comes from God. You with me? So this is God's news. The gospel is God's news, and as we'll see, it's news for the world. This is God's news for the world. But what is the news about? Well, we looked at this last week when we saw Christianity is Christ. It's certainly there in 1, 3 to 5, but it's there again in verse 9. For God is my witness, says Paul, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son. There's the of again. Now, what is Paul saying? Is he saying that the gospel belongs to God and it also belongs to Jesus? Well, absolutely. Because as we saw last week, Jesus is God. But here I think the of is not so much possession, but again, content, about, if you like, translated like that. So the gospel, God's news about his son, Jesus. That's what the gospel is. Now, the reason I'm stressing that, I mean, dear friends, most of us in this room know that, right? At least I hope we know that. That the gospel is God's good news about his son. The reason I want to say, you know, if it goes without saying, what is the next thing? It needs to be said. Because we can so often forget these things or just take it for granted, just assume it. And in the last six, seven months, I've been reading a number of things coming from people who really ought to know better where they've been talking about the gospel, especially the gospel in terms of its impact on our country and on social justice and all of those important things. And as I've looked at this gospel, this full gospel that they like to talk about, I have looked in vain for news about Jesus. And that is deeply distressing. These are people who ought to know better. And so I thought I'd just jump up on my little soapbox and my hobby horse this morning and just remind us again that when we talk about God's gospel, it is the gospel about his son. Yes, it has huge implications for our world, including the issue of social justice. Yes, it has all sorts of implications for us ourselves and our own personal well-being and our relationships. But fundamentally, the gospel is God's news about his son. Yeah? Why is this news good news? Well, here I want us to look particularly at verses 16 and 17. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, says Paul, for it is God's power to save, or the power of God for salvation, for everyone who believes, Jew first, Greek also. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Famous words. Why is this momentous news, this gospel about Jesus, good news? Well, what does Paul say in verse 16? The gospel is good news because it is God's powerful way to save people. That's why it's good news. Because it's the way in which God saves people. Now, if I said to you, 
Jesus is the way God saves people. You would, I hope, agree with me, especially having just had Easter, right? I mean, how are we actually saved? Well, we're actually saved by Jesus. By what Jesus did upon the cross, as we're going to come to the table in a moment and remember his death, what Jesus did on the cross is actually what saves us. But that's back in history, 2,000 plus years ago. The question is, how are we saved today? How are people saved today? Well, yes, by the death of Jesus then, but yes, through the gospel. That's what Paul means when he says the gospel is God's way of saving. You and I are saved by the news. So, you know, some of you are napping. And then I said that and you looked up and you thought, what was this, is it CNN or which news particularly? Fox? News? Whose news? What news? You and I are saved through news. Now, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. Well, so they say, but that's not true, right? I mean, sticks and stones can bruise you. They can certainly break your bones, but that will heal. But words can destroy you. I've met many young people who have been destroyed by words. Destroyed by the words of their parents. Destroyed by the words of their peer group at school. So demeaned, so smashed, so knocked down. It's the danger of social media, right? Social media, because it's words, it can destroy you. If you're not careful with it. I've certainly met people who destroy one another in marriage with their words. Words are massively powerful things in terms of the impact that words can have upon us. But I wonder if you've ever thought about the power of words when they come in the mouth of God. Let me remind you how the universe in which we live came into being. Now, I'm not talking about mechanism or time or process. But let me remind you that what is today began because of a word. And God said, let there be light. Let the sea teem with living creatures. Let the earth produce, interestingly, right? Let the earth produce living creatures. And God said, and it was so, God created the world by speaking. Whatever else happened as a result of God speaking, well, that's for scientific inquiry, for us to marvel at and try to understand. But that the world exists because of the word of God is crystal clear in the Bible. There were other options when Genesis was written. That the world originated through the thought of the gods, through the war of the gods, even through the sexual activity of the gods. But not so in the Bible. No, the world came into being through God speaking. And the New Testament tells us that the one who spoke was indeed the word who dwelt among us and that he upholds all things by his, what? Hebrews 1, powerful word. What this little part of Romans tells us is that God not only created by speaking, not only sustains the world by speaking, but that he saves people by words. Well, there's a thing. Now that we need to be saved, we will see next week. Although I suppose that for most of us, we already know that that's true. But what an extraordinary thing that God should save us in this peculiar way. That he should save us, one, by sending his son in history to die for us, but then two, by us hearing about it. And that somehow by hearing it and understanding it, and as we'll see in a moment, by believing in it, acting upon it, we actually pass from death to life, from darkness to to light. It is astonishing. And it works. <laughs> I know it works because it worked for me. And I hope it's worked for you. 
So why is this news, this news from God, good news? Because it's saving news. News that is powerful enough to save people. How does it do that? Well, as we'll see in a moment, it does that by us responding in the right way to it. But before we get there, I want you to look at verse 17. We know that the gospel is about God's son, Jesus. If you like, the gospel makes Jesus known. It reveals God's son, Jesus Christ. That's what the news does. It tells us about Jesus. You wouldn't know about Jesus if you didn't hear the news, right? You're not going to wake up one morning and think, oh, Jesus. If you haven't heard the news, it's why mission matters. It's why we should really be praying for our mission partners who carry the gospel to places where Christ is not yet known. Yes, our country needs the news, but the world needs the news, right? It's why we put a chunk of our money into supporting mission. Because the world needs this news. It needs to hear about Jesus. And Paul's got a lot to say about that in this letter. But look at verse 17. The gospel saves us because it makes something known. Can you see that in verse 17? What does it make known? You may never have thought of this before. So if that's you, please pay very careful attention now. The gospel saves us because it makes something known. And what it makes known is what Paul calls the righteousness of God. So it is a justice gospel because righteousness is just the word for justice. But who's justice? God's justice. So the gospel reveals the justice of God. Now, once you understand that God is just, then I hope that justice, even social justice, will matter a great deal to you, right? Because what's the point of believing in a God who is just and we don't care anything for social justice? That would be completely hypocritical. Agreed? But notice that the gospel is not about justice for us, but it's about the justice of God first and foremost. And this is the thing that gave dear Martin Luther such nightmares. Because the righteousness of God, the justice of God, is a frightening thing. If you yourself are unrighteous. I mean, if you're blameless in the heavens among the angels, well then the justice of God is something that you can rejoice in, right? But if you yourself are both victim and perpetrator, if you yourself are unrighteous, then is it good news to hear that God is just and righteous? The God that we will face one day is holy and righteous and just and perfect. Is that actually good news? This is why dear Martin Luther had the horrors. Because he understood the phrase, the righteousness of God, to mean that righteousness by which God has, by which he justly judges the unrighteous. And then, thank God, he understood the other part of of. <laughs> because the righteousness of God is not just the righteousness that God has, but in this letter, as we'll see, it is also the righteousness that God gives. What an extraordinary thing. That the righteous God should give righteousness. That is to say... Right standing, right relationship with himself. A few weeks ago, I think Good Friday, we spoke about our lives being hidden with Christ in God. It's the same idea here. The biblical doctrine of justification. Paul's going to have a lot to say about this in Romans. I hope you'll stay with us through the journey. It's well worth hearing more about. But for the moment, understand that this gospel is good news because it is God's powerful way of saving us because through this news and through responding to this news, the righteous God finds a way of bringing us into right relationship with Him. Now, I don't know how things are going for you on the relationship front, dear friends. Your relationships at the moment may be just A1. Your relationships may be a train smash. I've got no idea, right? In a, in a building like this with a 
these, as many of you as there are, I think that on the relational scale, we're all in different places at, and at different times in our lives, right? Even sometimes even in the same week. The most important relationship, though, before any other relationships get sorted out, is our relationship with God. All other relationships flow out of that. I've been rereading Francis Schaeffer's brilliant books, and I've been reminded again and again and again and again that when God is left out of the picture, everything else goes. When God is thrown away, everything else is thrown away. When God is dead, then humankind end up as dead. We have no beginning, we have no de destiny, our lives are meaningless machines, the playthings of chance, nothing really satisfies. That was my experience before I became a Christian. Nothing satisfied me. And even the relationships, and I had good relationships with my mom, my dad, my sister, at most of the time, um, even the relationships that I had and treasured, there was still an emptiness there. There was still something missing, right? What was missing was that one relationship that solves all other, well, doesn't solve all other relationships, but it makes all other relationships meaningfully possible. And that was a relationship with God. And this is why the gospel is good news, because it tells us how through Jesus, God has made a way for us unrighteous people to be in the right with him. And he gives us this righteousness through the gospel. Now, you have to agree with me that that is good news. Who is this good news for? Who benefits from it? <clears throat> well, on the screen, Christianity is good news for Afrikaners. I hope so. We used to think it was ours to keep. Especially ours. Yemel Sittal, where are you, Jason? Yeyenek mag het nie sê nie, my sake. Nee, nee. No, of course we can. Aren't you glad that God is multilingual? Good news for Afrikaners, for English people, for Isis Zulu, Isis Klasa, Ivenda, Sutu, everybody. Yebo. Even Jacob. The whole caboodle. Jews and Greeks. That's who Paul's talking about here. Jews and Palestinians. Russians and Ukrainians. The gospel is for all, right? Jews and Greeks just means everybody. Verse 5, to bring about the obedience of faith for his sake. 1 verse 5, from among who? All the nations. The gospel is intended for everyone. It is designed for everyone. God is not a nationalist. You'll be glad to know. He doesn't pick political parties. He doesn't pick countries. He doesn't pick football teams or rugby teams. I always feel God has this great dilemma. The Welsh pray, the Springboks pray, who's going to win? No, no, God is God for Everyone. And the salvation that comes to the world through the gospel is for everyone. It's one of the reasons, dear friends, why segregating churches was such an awful thing to do. We say the gospel is for everyone, and then we have Wittes and Swartes and Klerlinge and Indiers, and we all got to, I mean, why in the world? How is that not the most atrocious hypocrisy? Because the gospel is for all. But we do that in different ways, right? The gospel is for us middle class respectable people. But if you're homeless and you're a bit smelly, no, no, not for you. Please don't come in. But that's not right. The gospel is for all. And by the way, the genius of God is to make the way of responding, as we'll see in a moment, to his gospel, what? For all who believe. Now imagine, 
Imagine that the way of salvation was through brains, through being intellectual. Imagine if that's how God planned to save. The gospel is good news for all who are clever. Well, that rules a whole lot of us out, right? Not you, of course. The gospel is the way of salvation for all good people. Morality. Well, good luck on that. The gospel is the way of salvation for everyone who has a suitable status, religious status, or social status, or went to the right schools, or whatever. The gospel is salvation for all who are wealthy, or for all who are poor. Because it cuts both ways, right? Now, intellect, morality, status, financial status, either wealth or poverty, being smart or not being so smart, whatever it is, all of those things are exclusive, right? They exclude groups of people. What is the one thing that excludes nobody? The answer is faith. You're exercising it right now, right? You have faith that in about a minute or two, I'm going to stop talking. You have faith that the pew upon which you sit is going to keep holding you up till the end of the service. Good luck on that. You have faith that when you get back to your car, your car will actually be there. Well, I hope it will. You have faith that when you get in your car and you turn the key, it'll work and it'll take you home. You have faith that while you've been here, no one else has been in your home or ought not to have been there. I mean, we can joke about this. I seriously hope that's not true for you. I can have faith that when you come next Sunday, you'll park legally. And considerately, right? We all have faith, right? Faith is something we all exercise. Yes? Anybody can exercise faith because everybody exercises faith all the time. Because faith is just trusting something, depending on something. So faith is something that anybody can do. Which is why God picks that way to save people. Because it's available to everyone, right? If you have to be born in the right family, the right religion, the right school, well, then you toast. Because then if you're not, you're out. But everybody can have faith. But not everybody puts their faith in the right place. And that's where the limitation comes, right? The gospel is God's powerful way of saving everyone who believes what? The gospel. Faith in faith will never save you. That's just blind faith. That's superstition. That's not Christianity. But faith in Christ who puts us right with God, that'll save you. And the minute you hear that message, and the minute you believe and understand that message, and the minute you trust yourself to God through that message, here's the great news. In that moment, you are saved. So the whole issue of salvation lies at the point of personal decision. God has done all that needs to be done for the world to be saved. There's a message about that. The question is, what will you and I do with that message? That's the point at which the decision gets made, right? If you're not yet a Christian, now is the time. You need to believe that message. You really do. If you're not yet a Christian, you've been coming along for a few weeks, now is the time. You must believe the message. I can't save you, St. James can't save you, God can. But only if you believe what he says is true. And if you trust it. In 1.5, Paul speaks about the obedience of faith from among all the nations. Did you see that? What an extraordinary thing. The gospel doesn't come to you and me as an invitation, dear friends. It comes to us as a command which we must obey. This is not RSVP. This is you come. You trust. You believe. That's what God is commanding you to do today. I hope you'll do it. You can only do it with his help, but if you ask him, he'll help you to do it. He really will. He's in the business of doing that, if I may put that without sounding irreverent. And if you are already a Christian, what must you do with this gospel? 
Do you see it? Verse 17, it is revealed from faith to faith, from faith for faith. In other words, if you are a Christian and you have started the journey by faith, what are you meant to be doing? Keep trusting. Today, tomorrow, the next day, the next day, the next day. We never outgrow faith in Christ, dear friends. That's it. That's the full bottle. Keep trusting him. Verse 16 tells us, not only keep trusting him, but don't be ashamed of the news. Don't be ashamed of the news. There, you know, there are lots of anonymous Christians in the world. We ought not to be one of them. If you were on trial for being a Christian, would your friends at school, at university, at work, be able to supply enough evidence to have you convicted as guilty of being a Christian? Or do you keep your Christianity to yourself? This is for me and my home group in church. But I'm not going to talk about it at work. I'm not talking about lambasting people while they're trying to do their job with gospel tracts and news. I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about being openly and unashamedly Christian. Right? We've got to do that. I'm not ashamed, says Paul, nor should we be. And if we're not ashamed, then verse 15, we will be eager to tell it, right? I'm eager to preach the gospel, says Paul. Now, you don't have to stand up here and preach. But we must be telling this news. Because if this is the news by which God saves people, then if we won't tell this news, they will not be saved. Well, Food for thought, I hope. Time to come to the Lord's table. I'm going to ask the stewards to come forward. I'm going to lead us in a prayer as we come to the table together. Join me as we pray. We do not presume, Lord, to come to this your table, trusting in our own righteousness, but only in your great mercy. We are not fit to gather up the crumbs under the table. But you, Lord, are always the same, and your mercy is everlasting. Grant, therefore, gracious Lord, that we may by faith eat and drink, so that we may be united to Christ and he to us. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, of your infinite mercy, you gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption. He made thereby his one offering of himself never to be repeated, a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. He instituted and in his holy gospel commanded us to continue a perpetual memory of his precious death until he comes again, who on the night that he was betrayed took bread and broke it and said, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. After supper he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of your sins. You'll be served with bread, we'll wait, we'll eat together. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was given for you, preserve you, body and soul, to everlasting life. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you. Feed on him in your heart by faith and with thanksgiving. Again, you'll be served. We'll drink together. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was shed for you, preserve you, body and soul, to everlasting life. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you, and be thankful. Let's drink together. And let's stand and sing.